welcome back into Pro Football today, but it is time for the post game show, as I promised you, with Casey Hudson and Tom Vecchio. And we have a 35 to 10 victory for the Ravens in the books as they hosted the Buffalo Bills for Sunday Night Football. And I talked about it during the halftime show. This game started with a bang, the truck that is Derrick Henry. We threw out some facts and stats that were very interesting heading into this matchup, and I'm sure that the totals and the spreads and all the line movement made sense towards the end there. But let's get into it with Tom Vecchio, see what his opinion was. As we gauged the first half, we knew that the Bills were going to go into halftime, have some sort of rally pep talk. We saw some momentum coming out of halftime, but it was very short lived. I mean, from the 87 yard tutty for Henry, from some of the bloodhound work for the Ravens defense, from the almost comeback moment for the Bills. What did you see and take away from this game, Tom? Uh, I saw a lot of good things from the Ravens. You know, I would say over the first two weeks, uh, outside of like the the specifically the fourth quarter versus the Raiders, like week one, they looked good. They looked pretty good against the Raiders for the majority of that game. They obviously won against Dallas in week three. Like they were still a good team. They finally put it all together against a good team. So I was never wor like really worried about the Ravens. They just had to like get all the pieces in the right order. And that's kind of what they did tonight. If you are a Bills backer, you're a Bills fan, you have a, a conference ticket, a Super Bowl ticket, I really wouldn't be too worried about the Bills. There are some potential play calling things that you could have some issues with. But overall, I still think the Bills are going to be fine. And ultimately, I think this is a matchup we're going to see again when it comes to the playoffs. So all good things to the Ravens. They are absolutely trending in the right direction. They could easily reel off another three wins out of their next four games, something like that. But good stuff from both sides, mostly from the Ravens. Absolutely. I feel like this is one of the most complete games for the Ravens thus far. They show that they can fire off on all cylinders. You saw all the key playmakers um, in action and useful. There was great stuff out of Mark Andrews when it came to his blocks, key blocks of the night. So a lot for us to get into. A lot of excitement, like I said, opened up with a bang. Line movement, I mean, it's two and a half going in, moved to 15 at halftime. So we'll see what other thoughts we have on this matchup. we got a quick break coming up here, so stick with us on Pro Football today. The postgame show, Casey Hudson, Tom Vecchio. And then after we talk about Bills Ravens, we got to run through another Another wild Sunday slate. So don't go anywhere. Quick break coming up here and stay tuned with us here on Sports Grid. Anyone that's been to a sporting event, the atmosphere before a game, I think Game Time Decisions has that same exact atmosphere. This is our arena. This is what we do. There is going to be an energy to Game Time Decisions that you will feel night in and night out. The excitement you get when you, when you lock your bets and when you're figuring out what you want to do, we can zone in on the biggest games each night. I want this to be the place that people come to before the game start, so they feel as ready as possible to lock in their cards. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. We're gonna go through every single thing, and I've got a great team behind me that's gonna help me get the job done. There is not gonna be a better place, I promise you, than Game Time Decisions to get that new information, react to it, and be able to then bet accordingly. We will have everything at our disposal, and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on Sports Grid. Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on Sports Grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports screen.
Welcome back into Pro Football Today. It's the post-game show with Casey Hudson and Tom Vecchio here on Sports Grid TV. Running through the Sunday night football showdown, the Ravens just hosted, not only hosted the Bills, but beat the Bills 35-10. to A very complete game by the Ravens, checking all the boxes from offense, defense, to special teams. Obviously, the big performance from Derrick Henry, but it was a sound performance for the, for the offense overall, building off of what they did well versus the Cowboys, carrying that momentum into this game. Tom mentioned earlier, too, this is something we can see them continue to do for a couple of games here, but most importantly, do not count out the Buffalo Bills. Now, I will also say this. We did see some spark coming out of halftime for the Bills. We did also see some injuries for the Bills. So they're working down a few units here and still trying to perform and produce. We saw Josh Allen get a little shaken up there for a minute. So a number of things play into this. So I'm right there with you, Tom, when you say it's not time to panic. But when we run through this, 54.8% completion rate for Josh Allen tonight. Um, they struggled. They were only 50% in the red zone. Third downs were just not it for them tonight. 23% efficiency when it came to third downs. So we say don't panic, but where can we potentially see the Bills go from here in terms of successfully starting to get back in the W column? I mean, I think it starts immediately next week, and I think James Cook needs to continue to play a bigger role in their offense overall. Um, Josh Allen, like he has this connection with Cook. They need to look to some of the you know consistent short passes, which will then open up some of the deeper passes with someone like Keon Coleman, you know, maybe getting up the seam with Dalton and Cade. So, you know, Allen, of course, could have been more effective tonight, a little more efficient. Um, I don't think we need to worry about what Allen is capable of doing. He actually has continued to start off the year with no interceptions. Uh, looking to Josh Allen to be more of a passer. They need to, like, remove him from the run game to protect him. He's already dealing with this hand issue on his left hand. So I'm not too worried about the bills. I think finding consistency in their receiving core, that's always going to be a little bit tough. I think Khalil Shakir will continue to be the best number one option, but we're going to see Keon Coleman step up at times. We're going to see James Cook be involved at times. It's going to be Dalton Kincaid. Um, it's good stuff from the bills, but they need to kind of fix things moving forward and continue to get James Cook involved. He needs like close to 20 plus total touches on a weekly basis. And that's when I think their offense will be operating at like hundred percent efficiency. Couldn't agree more. Not to mention is that you also did mention some play calling uh, chef who's there. Hopefully that's something they can get in control as well. Cook closes out the night with 39 rushing yards through nine carries. And sometimes we like to look at him for those rush combined with receiving yards, only nine receiving yards as well. So it didn't really look like they got, uh, James Cook going in that Swiss Army knife role that he has a tendency to be efficient at. So maybe that's something that they'll trans, uh, translate over into the next game coming up here. Josh Allen followed up Cook with 21 rushing yards himself, four or five carries. As you mentioned, you got to protect this guy as long as he is uh, trying to bang through some injuries. 180 passing yards, zero tutties, and a clean slate when it comes to interception. So at least he has that going for him. Shakir with a big chunk play. For the Bills, but closed out the night 62 receiving yards through four receptions. Coleman, we saw some uh, attitude, but we saw some passion out of him on the sidelines. He was frustrated in that first half, 51 receiving yards, three receptions. So, as you said, some key things. What were some of your favorite things that you saw out of the Ravens tonight? Was it that 87 uh, yard tutty or was it something <laughs> else? I mean, they keep things super simple. Like when the game plan is go and the game script is going in their favor, it's just a lot of runs from Derrick Henry and a lot of runs from Lamar. I will say from a betting perspective, if things are going great, like you're probably just going to crush all your Derrick Henry bets on attempts, on yards, on this, that, the other thing. When things are going great, that also means that we're going to find a really, really tough time finding any level of consistency in their passing game. Justice Hill was there a leading receiver with six receptions coming out of the backfield, likely with one, Bateman with one, Henry with uh, three, Zay Flowers with one catch for 10 yards. Like there's no level of consistency from their receiving core because they're so far ahead. They just run the ball like 80% of the time. So it's great if you're on Lamar rushing props or Henry rushing props or whatever it might be. If you have the Ravens on the spread, like that's awesome. But the receiving is a massive, massive issue from a betting perspective, not from like an actual team perspective. Yeah, that's definitely something worth pointing out because some of these rosters that have so much versatility, you don't want to come in so heavy on a guy that you think is going to duplicate or replicate his performance from the previous week because it's just too easy to shuffle around. So funny enough, Hill with 78 receiving yards, but it's Derrick Henry with 199 rushing yards, 24 carries and one magnificent tutty. Um, 
Stick with us here on Pro Football Today. We've got more football to get into. We've got a couple more upsets. The NFL is still partially drunk. Who knows? But Tom and I are going to continue to dig into it and then start some previews. So hang with us here on Pro Football Today, the postgame show with Casey Hudson, Tom Vecchio, on the other side of this quick break. Anyone that's been to a sporting event, the atmosphere before a game, I think Game Time Decisions has that same exact atmosphere. This is our arena. This is what we do. There is going to be an energy to Game Time Decisions that you will feel night in and night out. The excitement you get when you when you lock your bets and when you're figuring out what you want to do, we can zone in on the biggest games each night. I want this to be the place that people come to before the game start, so they feel as ready as possible to lock in their cards. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. We're gonna go through every single thing, and I've got a great team behind me that's gonna help me get the job done. There is not gonna be a better place, I promise you, than Game Time Decisions to get that new information, react to it, and be able to then bet accordingly. We will have everything at our disposal, and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on Sports Grid. Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on Sports Grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. at it with pro football today the post game show with casey hudson and tom vecchio running through the sunday slate now so in case you missed the sunday night football showdown ravens come out on top 35 to 10 solid performance across the charts from the ravens can they continue well we'll find out as for some other fun games in the books on this sunday we had a massive showdown between the minnesota vikings and the green bay packers as expected or as speculated love makes the return shows up in a brett Favre jersey brett Favre also also shouts out his love for the walk up on social media. But we have Sam Darnold, who's continuing to thrive for the Vikings. Vikings off to a hot start, continuing to roll, pulling off the W 31 to 29. But what a tango this one was. Darnold, 275 passing yards, three tutties, one interception. Love coming in hot making his return known 389 passing yards four touchdowns but three interceptions tom what did you love hate enjoy about this game i mean there's so much to it yeah a lot going on uh like you said vikings just continuing to roll week after week sam darnold looking good uh most notably they got jordan addison back he did find the end zone wasn't on massive massive usage the one note that i will continue to make is that Aaron Jones combined rushing plus receiving is probably going to be one of the best bets we have from the Vikings offense outside of Justin Jefferson. Like Justin Jefferson is like, we can carve that into stone every week that like, yeah, he's going to have a lot of yards. He's going to have the targets. He's probably going to score. We know that, but Aaron Jones for the, for the Vikings is super solid for the Packers. I mean, Jordan Love looks good. Now, they were an extreme passing game script. That's why we saw him up at 54 attempts. Obviously, the interceptions are there as well. We saw Christian Watson get hurt, and his ankle got, like, jammed up and kind of bent. It does not look good. 
We saw both Reed and Wicks have big games. That's what we should be expecting moving forward. Outside of Josh Jacobs, who knows the consistent option on the ground game, if Watson is going to miss time, it's going to be Dobbs, Reed, and Wicks as their three options, which is an awesome set of uh, you know skill players for Jordan Love, who if he's going to look this good in his first game back after a, a knee injury or a slight knee injury that caused him to miss time, I think things are looking up for the Packers. So it's a loss. You also lost a key wide receiver, but it is not time to panic. Things are fine for the Packers. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you said it. To charge back the way that Love did coming back off of that injury, I was already feeling a little uh, concerned on on bringing him back in so quickly and like maybe not trying to overutilize the run game. I wasn't sure what to expect, but to come back and put up 300-plus in the passing yards and spread the ball around, I mean, Love is the real deal, and the Love will continue to roll through. And plus, you got a matchup between rivals here. It can really go either way with both teams being as stacked as they are, and you got to give Love where Love is due. Aaron Jones. 93 yards on the ground and 22 carries. And then you got Justin Jefferson, six receptions for 85 yards. You can always count on him for a chunk player too. Found the end zone as well. The Vikings were in complete command of that first quarter. Packers finally started to show some way in the second quarter. Commanded the fourth quarter, trying to get back into the game entirely. Hence this narrow escape of 31 to 29 Vikings coming out on top. We had another close game in the mix. Saints taking on the Falcons, another in division toe to toe battle. Falcons came out on top 26 to 24. Defensive battle in the beginning, but. Regardless, Kirk Cousins and company continue to shine. You got Drake London, who led the wide receiving group with 64 receiving yards. Um, You got Kirk Cousins, 238 passing yards, one interceptions, no passes to the touchdown zone, though. They opened the scoring, but the Saints continue to respond every time the Falcons started to get ahead. What did you see in this one? Uh, What I saw in this one is I'm going to say a bit of a fluky game, and I partially want to say that because I was on the under in this game. But, (laughs) uh, you know, we we saw the Falcons, they didn't score any offensive touchdowns. We saw their Mm -hmm. touchdowns come from defense and special teams. So, yeah, the Falcons won. I I was on the Falcons as well as on the Falcons and the under, so I got one of them right. But I would say ran on the bad side of variance because of those fluky touchdowns. (laughs) <laughs> we are continuing to see Kyle Pitts play basically no role in the Falcons passing offense. And we also saw Bijan Robinson play a very, very limited role, which Raheem Morris had some comments after the game with saying he wanted to roll with Tyler Algier a bit more. Uh, you know, someone that likes a, a good amount of consistency when it comes to backfields. Robinson is a player that, again, should be pushing towards 20 total touches. When he has seven carries for 28 yards and only four receptions, like, That's not good enough. He is too good to not have the ball in his hands. So ultimately, I think the Falcons need to get a few things worked out on offense. You know, I said when we previewed this game last week and on on Thursday, like this was a huge game for the Saints because they started off 2-0. They're scoring 90 points. They're doing this, that, the other thing. They're now 2-2. Like they fell back down to earth. They also had no passing touchdowns from Carr. And the the touchdowns that they had came from the running game, two of which came from Taysom Hill, who is now Mm -hmm. hurt. Uh, I think he had an abdominal. So it's a bit all over the place for the Saints. I still think they need to have uh, Olavi and uh, Rashid Shahid as the two options in the pass conference, which, which they did have. Just want to see him find the end zone. Yeah, absolutely. And the surprising part, I'm with you on that one because with what we've seen, at least the Saints defense do consistently. I didn't expect 26 points to be put up on their team. And then we saw the Falcons defense show some some strength and some rhythm, but I didn't expect them to come in and come in too strong. So I thought the Saints were going to have a little bit more control here, but you said it, Taysom Hill, if it wasn't for him finding the end zone, who knows what this game would have been and a number of injuries to push things back. And then, of course, it was the field goal show the rest of the way in that second half there. Uh, as for another game, that uh, narrow escape for the Texans, 20 20- Four to twenty versus the Jaguars. So a big one to see if the Jaguars can find any signs of life this season. But weirdly, that the Texans just got by by four points. What was the the result and the takeaway for you in this one? Yeah, this game was kind of all over the place. I think it showed. I want to say that this showed the best of what C.J. Stroud can do, which is you know. I want to say elevate his game when the the lights are the brightest, which he kind of showed in that fourth quarter, bringing them from behind. Uh, It's a a little bit all over the place. One, because there was no Tank Dell for the Texans. There was no Joe Mixon. There was no Damian Pierce. So it was Cam Akers and Daria Gumbawale, who did have that touchdown to ultimately win the game. Uh, Great stuff from Nico Collins, who continues to be one of the best receivers in the league. I'm going to put him up there in the top five going for, I'm going to say close to 100 plus yards every single week. We can count on that. 
Uh, on the other side for the Jaguars, it's looking bad, right? Their offense finally looked better, but their defense is still atrocious. We're seeing some conflicting reports at the beginning in the first quarter game where Travis Etienne was on the sidelines. He doesn't even have his helmet on, but they said he wasn't dealing with an injury. He gets back in there. The best part about this game from the Jaguars was Brian Thomas Jr. continuing to break out in his rookie season. He's going to be probably the best option when it comes to them looking from a prop perspective. If their defense is going to be this bad and they're going to be constantly passing the ball, Brian Thomas is going to be involved every single game. So regardless of what you think of their team overall, he's still going to have some amount of value that we can find on mostly a weekly basis. Yeah, and he's a key guy to keep uh, keeping an eye on because when they played the Bills, them being the Jaguars, uh, I remember Lisi and the guys kind of putting in some live bets on Thomas in that second half there. And even though the Jaguars weren't really able to find any signs of life, Thomas was able to do some work for them, and some people were able to kind of cash in on the work that he was able to produce. So I got to constantly keep in mind, Stroud causes uh, this game 345 passing yards, two tutties. As you said, Ackers being that guy, 53 yards on the ground. But Nico Collins, he's looking at a 1,000-yard season if he keeps doing what he's doing. 151 receiving yards through 12 receptions and one touchdown for him as well. So... It was good to see that rally. You have to kind of have that adversity, especially when we're talking about a guy like C.J. Stroud and company being a team to go deeper in playoffs this year. So those moments, regardless of who the team is, you've got to be able to see that your leader can pull you through. I think you make a tremendous point with mentioning that and his ability to push in that fourth quarter. Of course, a number of other games. I was telling Tom during the break beforehand, I felt like there was a lot of close scoring games within six, seven points, even less. I mean, four or five points, which is crazy enough. But then you've got a few blowouts throughout the day. Of course, the Niners finally get back in the W column. So we've got plenty more football to break down and get into before previewing the upcoming week. Don't forget the Pro Football Today pregame party tomorrow for a doubleheader, me, Tom, Dave, and Adam. So continue to hang out with us for the postgame show as we run through the Sunday slate. Mark your calendars to join the pregame show tomorrow here on Sports Grid TV. we got a quick break coming up here, but on the other side, we continue to roll with what's gone down on this Sunday before previewing ahead. So stick with us on the other side of this break. Anyone that's been to a sporting event, the atmosphere before a game, I think Game Time Decisions has that same exact atmosphere. This is our arena. This is what we do. There is going to be an energy to Game Time Decisions that you will feel night in and night out. The excitement you get when you, when you lock your bets and when you're figuring out what you want to do, we can zone in on the biggest games each night. I want this to be the place that people come to before the game start, so they feel as ready as possible to lock in their cards. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. We're gonna go through every single thing, and I've got a great team behind me that's gonna help me get the job done. There is not gonna be a better place, I promise you, than Game Time Decisions to get that new information, react to it, and be able to then bet accordingly. We will have everything at our disposal, and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on Sports Grid. Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on Sports Grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports screen.
welcome back into Pro Football Today. It's the post-game party with Casey and Tom running through this Sunday slate. A lot of narrow escapes for some teams, a few upsets for others, and then a couple big scorers out there. So we're going to run through all of that fun, uh, starting with the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Indianapolis Colts. This goes in the narrow escape column. You've got the Colts coming out 27 to 24, but what a game this ended up being. Justin Fields closes out the day with 312 passing yards, one tutty. Joe Flacco in the mix for the Colts. Tom will explain why shortly. 168 passing yards, two touchdowns. Jonathan Taylor led the group when 88 rushing yards through 21 carries. And then Pittman with a 100-plus yard performance. No surprise there. But um, on top of some injuries, what are some other things that you saw in this matchup? Yeah, this is uh, a big game for the Colts, obviously, starting off the year a little bit slow. Now, Anthony Richardson is hurt. There are some reports that he may not miss game time. Jonathan Taylor is apparently dealing with a mild high ankle sprain, and the high, high ankle sprain for a running back is basically one of the last things you want to ever hear. Uh, like you said, Pittman over 100 yards. If Flacco is going to be in there for any amount of time, it's clear that one of his favorite targets is going to be Michael Pittman. That is something we absolutely want to key in on. And then Trey Sermon would be the running back to step up if we do see Jonathan Taylor sit out. Obviously, a full week away before they play the next time. On the other side, Justin Fields looked pretty good. Now, the receivers, they need to figure some things out when it comes to their offense. But over 300 yards, no interceptions. He's got to get that fumble under control. Basically did nothing with Najee Harris on the ground. George Pickens, great game from him. The news is there are reports that Russell Wilson it may be ready to go for the next week. If he is starting, I'm going to be really, really interested in actually taking unders on Russell Wilson because I don't expect him to be effective. And Justin Fields has looked good. So I'm yeah. I'm waiting to, for the Russell Wilson news, which like one of my theories I think I'm, I'm building this season is I think it might be coming on – Saturday afternoons, Schefter, Adam Schefter starts tweeting a lot of stuff out on Saturday afternoons at like three or four o'clock. That's when we got some news yesterday about Rashad White, which we can get into. So Saturday afternoons, pay attention to that. Yes, that was a great one for you to pass out. Our production team was like, we're writing, we're taking this one down and uh, locking in on this one. So Saturdays is where you get your news so that you can adjust your lines. Tom had some big payas, uh, payoffs with that one. But I like that you brought up the fact that Russell Wilson might be trying to get back on the field here or will be trusted to get back on the field after injury, but Fields does not look bad. Mind you, both of these quarterbacks have been some of the top, not some of, the top sacked quarterbacks, but Fields weathered four different sacks today and still got this yardage and then kept a clean slate when it came to interceptions. Fumbles do have to come under control, as you mentioned, Tom, but I don't think that this should be a job that just gets tossed back over to Russell Wilson. Um, when it comes Great. to the injuries on the other side, also, something to gauge is the fact that um, you mentioned the high ankle sprain when it comes to Taylor. But you, if you get a guy like Flacco being like leading the team here, while he's going to love Pittman, he's somebody, too, who is probably going to also try to spread out the targets when it comes inside of the red zone area. So we can keep a closer eye on that. And then I love the tip when it comes to Saturdays. So that was the showdown between the Steelers and the Colts. Um, I don't know <laughs> how much to say on this one, but let's talk about it for a second. Broncos, Jets. Jets fall to the Broncos by one point. Another narrow escape column we've got to get into because this was a wonky first half. I didn't know what I was watching for a minute there. Bo Nix closed out this game with 60 passing yards and one touchdown. Then you got Aaron Rodgers with 225 passing yards. We saw some big plays by the Jets in that first half. They were really excited. We thought things were just going to completely take off for the Jets at some point. And then this is the end result. 10 to 9. What did we watch here? What is this? What uh, was this? <laughs> there was weather involved. There was missed field goals. Now, granted, you know, we're, we're dealing with two good defenses. Or I'm going to say like two well above average defenses. So seeing a rookie quarterback struggle on a road game against a good defense, Okay, we could we could take that from Bo Nix, who you know I've said like he's off to his of some struggles to start his rookie season. Add in some weather, and it's not going to be looking good for either team. So, 19 total points is insanely low. Now, from the other side, you know Rodgers had like a pretty good game, right? Over 200 mm -hmm. yards. You think they'd be putting up more points? They did have some missed field goals. They had that missed field goal at the end. They just didn't get Brees Hall involved at all. And I, I've talked about the split between Brees Hall and Braylon Allen in the backfield for the Jets. And, you know, I'm particularly high on Braylon Allen. I just think he's going to be a solid asset. But, man, Brees Hall should be the number one. He should be the the player that we are focusing in on to be that consistent option. And when they're not getting it done on the ground, it has to turn to Rodgers in the air. And 
they just need to start converting third downs. They need to like push that little bit more to get in, especially in a game like today that had this rain, they, they can't be settling for these long field goals, which I'm going to say cost them the game. So yeah. a, a bit of a wash, no pun intended because of the rain for the jets, but they got to get things corrected as they head to London to play the early game next week against the Vikings who are red hot. Yes, and making those corrections or mentally figuring out how you other situ situations, weather, certain weather situations, I should say, because London is known for its mist, its rain, its unpredictable and irritating weather at this exact time of the year. So who knows what they could be facing at this hour in London next week. So good things to keep an eye on as we continue to roll through. We're going to start this game, but we'll continue it on the other side. Rams versus the Bears. Bears get the W here. We know the Rams roster is completely banged up. Stafford, 224 passing yards, one interception. Caleb Williams, a little lower on the pole when it comes to passing yards, 157 and one touchdown. Big performance from Swift on both sides, on the ground and receiving wise in order to help them pull off this 24 to 18 victory. Uh, I don't know where to start on this one because we can only talk about the Rams banged up roster so much. Yeah, it was, uh, wasn't the prettiest game to watch. You know, Kyron Williams is going to continue to be the bright spot for the Rams, going well over 20 touches, as he should be on most nights. Um, for the Bears, like, finally getting DeAndre Swift going, which is good. The receiving core for the Bears, we can break down on the other side of the break, but it is looking rough. Like, maybe one player has a big game on a weekly basis, but there is just no level of consistency that we can possibly find. I think the running back room and maybe Cole Quebec could be the best options when it comes to the Bears, but you know, we'll break down a little bit further. Um, it, it's a tough go right now for the Bears. They won the game, which is great for them, but from a, a prop level, it's, it's a little bit inconsistent. Absolutely, especially when fans are screaming for more involvement from Moore and Allen. So we will continue to unpack this. Make sure you continue to hang out with us here on Pro Football Today. It's the post-game show with Casey Hudson and Tom Vecchio. Another reminder to join us for the pre-game show tomorrow. Double header, but quick break coming up here. We continue to chat Bears versus Rams, so don't go anywhere. Stick with us on the other side of this break. Anyone that's been to a sporting event, the atmosphere before a game, I think Game Time Decisions has that same exact atmosphere. This is our arena. This is what we do. There is going to be an energy to Game Time Decisions that you will feel night in and night out. The excitement you get when you, when you lock your bets and when you're figuring out what you want to do, we can zone in on the biggest games each night. I want this to be the place that people come to before the game start, so they feel as ready as possible to lock in their cards. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. We're gonna go through every single thing, and I've got a great team behind me that's gonna help me get the job done. There is not gonna be a better place, I promise you, than Game Time Decisions to get that new information, react to it, and be able to then bet accordingly. We will have everything at our disposal, and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on SportsGrid. Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on SportsGrid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports screen.
Welcome back into Pro Football Today. It's the post-game show with Casey Hudson and Tom Vecchio running through the Sunday slate. Before we went to the break, we were just chatting about the Bears grabbing a 24-18 win over the Rams. And Tom was just breaking down the fact that they've got to figure out what's going on in the wide receiving room for the Bears. But also, we've talked about how many injuries are racking up when it comes to the Rams. And honestly, I only recognize two names when it came to the wide receiving group over there. So you let me know where you want to start, Tom, or how we can even approach these two teams when it comes to moving further down the NFL season and probably looking at props, it could be potential, but there's a lot going on on both of these rosters right now. Right. When it comes to the Bears, like it, I'm going to have to dig into things more, but I, I'm not sure how much it's ultimately going to matter. When we look at uh, the three wide receivers, DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, and Romo Dunes, it doesn't matter what we look at in terms of snaps, uh, routes run, yards per route run, whatever it might be, air yards, average depth of target. It doesn't matter about their underlying statistics and underlying metrics of what we see from them. I don't know how much of that we're going to see in a game. So even if we want to say this player has amazing underlying metrics, he just needs to put it together on the field, we may never see that from the Bears. And that like brings a, a high level of inconsistency that we can't trust. So even if a player has bad underlying metrics, it might just be his game because the game script forces them into a certain passing narrative that we just can't account for prior to the game. So the Bears might just be a stay away from team for me at this point, unless like Keenan Allen misses games again, his hamstring pops back up and he continues to have an issue. Then we can go back to DJ more just because there's more clarity. But right now it's too cloudy. From the Ram side of things and their receiving core, yeah, we're going to see these backup you know, players taking these large step forward in their offense. It's kind of the same thing where, you know, Tutu Atwell, Demarcus Robinson, Colby Parkinson, those are the players I think should be the top three when it comes to their lineup. But if we're seeing Jordan Whitt Whittington involved more and more, that's something we may not be accounting for because he didn't play on a, on a large portion of snaps over the past few weeks, and now he's involved in a big way. So Kyron Williams is the answer for the Rams up until now. I, I think Colby Parkinson does have some type of on-field connection with, Stafford, he did have the second most targets on the team, but ultimately, if they're not putting that into use and they're not getting the proper targets to him and they're super low A dot targets, as we've seen these flat out routes to him, he's never going to be picking a mass amount of yards and these deep random shots downfield to Tutu Atwell or to Marcus Robinson could be the answer, even though statistically and like metric wise, they don't make the most sense. Mm hmm. So both sides, probably something to stay away from until we see things shake out a little bit more or figure out what the heck is going on for both of these rosters. Um, but when it comes to the wide receiver conversation, when it comes back to the injury conversation, unfortunately, some tough potential tough news, I, I should preference by saying for the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, they're saying that Rasheed Rice could potentially have torn his ACL is what I was seeing in reports. Obviously, they have to do tests. We're going to hear a lot more uh, tomorrow. But regardless, you've already got Pacheco. You've already got a number of guys that have started to go down for this offense that was so electrifying week one. A lot of people were like, this offense is the best that it's been probably almost two seasons. So what do you see versus uh, Chiefs versus Chargers? And uh, how worried should we be about how far the Chiefs might go if the injuries continue to rack up well that's the how far they may go is tough to answer now hope uh, depending on obviously the trade deadline if they make some massive move but right now things are looking tough because their offense has kind of been stagnant over the past few weeks we finally saw Travis Kelsey have a big game which is coming at the most important time it's not like you know we weren't going to expect that from him at some point but with the news that Rice potentially tore his ACL and is going to be out for the season, and Hollywood Brown is ex already expected to be out for the season, and Isaiah Pacheco is already expected to be out for eight weeks, if not more, this is the time where other players have to step up to do just a little bit more, and it's not going to be a massive, massive game week in and week out from Xavier Worthy. Justin Watson is a player that I'm going to have my eye on, especially when it comes to a fantasy perspective and a betting perspective. I think he's been there for a few years. I think he has to be that next player up after Xavier Worthy, we know is super fast, but in terms of the underneath, like uh, quick moving the chains type of routes, I think Justin Watson is going to be that type of player. Carson Steele in the backfield should still be that guy alongside Samaj P. Ryan. I don't have a whole lot of interest in there. I think Justin Watson is going to be a key player outside of Worthy and Kelsey. Yeah, he's always been my guy to watch, but that may have been slightly biased because I recognize him. I've interviewed him. I've chatted with him when he was on the Bucks roster. I mean, in the beginning of camp when Tom Brady first got there, Tom Brady said that this was a kid that you can keep an eye on as well. So even when it comes to those underpasses, every once in a while you can see him downfield making some catches. It hasn't worked out yet. 
with him with the Chiefs, but maybe it's in the books. Still some things to run through. We're talking about the Chiefs versus the Chargers. We've got other Sunday slates to, d- to break down. Don't go anywhere because we also are going to start some previews for the upcoming week. we got another quick break here on Sports Grid TV. Join us back on the other side of this break. Anyone that's been to a sporting event, the atmosphere before a game, I think Game Time Decisions has that same exact atmosphere. This is our arena. This is what we do. There is going to be an energy to Game Time Decisions that you will feel night in and night out. The excitement you get when you when you lock your bets and when you're figuring out what you want to do, we can zone in on the biggest games each night. I want this to be the place that people come to before the game start so they feel as ready as possible to lock in their cards. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. We're gonna go through every single thing and I've got a great team behind me that's gonna help me get the job done. There is not gonna be a better place, I promise you, than Game Time Decisions to get that new information, react to it, and be able to then bet accordingly. We will have everything at our disposal and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on SportsGrid. Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on SportsGrid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York team has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports screen. Watching Pro Football today, the post game show with Casey Hudson and Tom Vecchio here on Sports Grid TV. Running through the Sunday slate, talking about the Chiefs versus the Chargers. Chiefs got to figure out what to do if Rice did indeed tear his ACL, but regardless, they'll be down another receiving option when it comes to their roster. We got to see other guys step up. Tom mentioned Justin Watson. I fully support that unbiasedly, as I will continue to say, but whoever decides to believe me, it's really on you. But since I brought bias into it, and I was obviously talking about my Tampa Bay Bucks that everybody likes to make fun of me for, you got a big game from them today, 33-16, to topping the Philadelphia Eagles. And uh, from a, I don't know, more humorous standpoint, Tom Brady felt a little salty today when Baker Mayfield apparently made it sound like the locker room was very stressful when Brady was there. And then they just had some digs and back and forth. And uh, Tom Brady basically closed the chapter by saying that the uh, fun is left for a Disney World. And that is a wrap on that. I mean, where do we start with this one? Because I think Tom Brady's just missing football. I don't know why he needed to go for Baker at all. Uh, I mean, ultimately, Brady was right. Like, I, like that's the conclusion of it. It's like, they won a Super Bowl. Like, he was right. Like, he like he demands that players be at his level of intensity in terms of being prepared. Like, all these quotes over the years about him coming on saying, like, you have to use practice as if it's a game. So, you like, you have that level of intensity. Like, I kind of respect that. I Taking a shot at a current player on an organization, that's a different story. But, like, Brady is right. They won a Super Bowl because he brought a high level of professionalism day in and day out to watching film and studying and all those sorts of things is kind of my take on it. Okay, okay. I wasn't sure which way you're going to lean on that one, but yes, it is. You have to give him credit. He has a championship mindset. He did bring that to Tampa, but I can vouch for the fact that he did 
make it a little extra stressful, but you saw the guys get so excited to see him walk on the field. Mike Evans joking around with him, Levante David. Everybody was excited to see Tampa Tom back in Tampa. But it's not the Tampa Tom show anymore. No, it's time for oh. Chef Baker to get the job done. 347 passing yards, two touchdowns. Bucky Irving, who I'm sure you have the things to break down for us when it comes to him. 49 rushing yards through 10 carries, one tutty himself. Mike Evans with a big day, 94 receiving yards, found his self in the end zone through eight receptions also. I mean, the Bucks really did control this game from top to bottom, and it was great to see because of some of the injuries that they have racked up on their roster. We saw the injury report look extremely questionable there for a second, and some other guys get back involved. But Baker did bake. Tampa grabs another W. They're sitting at 17-1 to odds to top the NFC. Uh, what are some big takeaways from the Bucks and the Eagles today? Oh, this game went basically exactly how we spoke about it on Sunday and Monday. And I said multiple times that Mike Evans was going to get his and quarterbacks should keep their star wide receivers happy. And just because we had a few slow games for Mike Evans, we were going to get a bounce back game against a bad Eagles secondary. And that's what we got. And, you know, Chris Godwin still had a very solid game overall. Um, and as we had said, and I had said multiple times, I wanted to see Bucky Irving more involved. I wanted to see Bucky Irving rushing plus receiving props. We got notes and quotes from Todd Bow saying we want he Bucky Irving uh, earned more touches, right? And, and he was going to be involved more and more. And that's exactly what we got. We got a touchdown from him. He hit the over on his rushing plus receiving only by a few yards, but he did hit it. Baker continues to look good on the other side. It's a mess for the Eagles. I want to say we have to take this with a grain of salt because, A, they're missing Lane Johnson, one of their best offensive linemen. They're missing A.J. Brown. They're missing Devonta Smith. So it was a big Saquon game. It was a big game from Dallas Goddard. As I said, it would be on Thursday when we previewed this game. Those were going to be the two main players for the Eagles. Did that happen? Yes. Did they come away with the win? No. So Eagles fans, I know it seems like the the earth, like the, the sky is falling right now and everyone's calling for Nick Sirianni to be fired, but they're just not 100% healthy. So I don't know how we can like take this as, oh, they're bad. They're not 100% healthy. So like, like let's, let's wait and see. Yeah, limited options. Not to mention, is it copy and paste some things for last week for the Eagles roster? You've got her that led the wide receiving group or the wide receivers or receiving units, whatever you want to say, with 62 receiving yards through seven receptions, not able to find the end zone for himself. Barkley continuing to rack up in the rush and receiving combination category. He had 32 receiving yards, but 84 rushing yards on the ground through 10 carries. As for the Bucks side of the ball for two more seconds, you mentioned Mike Evans having a big performance. You have been locked in on that since we started this show pro football today here on sports grid chris godwin 69 receiving yards but it's kate Otten. of course i got to give my tight end love that actually came up not too short 52 receiving yards to six receptions helping out in the middle of the field there just a little bit so of course i had to throw that in the mix tight end love tampa bay love i'm a happy gal moving on to another matchup of the day we have the Patriots and the 49ers. 49ers excited to get a W going here. You've got Brock Purdy, 288 passing yards, one touchdown, but a lone interception. It's the big game from Jordan Mason. You and I have talked about this game leading up to today. We also talked about the fact of who was going to step up and what's going on with the Niners and some of their injuries, and you called it. You said Mason's got to be the hero 123 yards on the ground sounds pretty heroic to me. One touchdown through 24 carries. Oh, and the other guy you mentioned, by the way, Jennings, leading the wide receiving group. 88 receiving yards through three receptions. So imagine the massive air plays we saw this guy reel in today. What can we take away from this matchup? 30 to 13, Niners get in the W column. Yeah, this is basically as good of a game script and like start to finish plot that you would want from the 49ers after last, last week's collapse against the Rams. They're at home against an inferior team. They take care of business. They cover the spread, which was 10 and a half points. And everything was like firing on all the cylinders. They got Debo Samuel back. They got George Kittle back. Kittle finds the end zone on an amazing grab and he was covered by three defenders. Huge game on the ground where they control the clock 100% of the time. And they come up with a big defensive play with Fred Warner when he has the pick six. Like, this is 49ers football. You have great yep. defense, great running, and then the passing is opportunistic. And they checked off every single box. Would they love to have CMC healthy? Sure. Are there reports that he may be back by early November, whatever it is? Yeah, but they ultimately don't need him right now. Pat's side of the ball, things are bad. Like, things are bad for the Patriots right now. There's really no other way to put it. Brissett just doesn't have the tools around him. 
Drake May, when are they going to put him out there? Ramondre Stevenson looked great in the first two weeks. Doesn't look so great over the past two weeks. Yeah, the adjustments have just not been able to come through for the Patriots. And you said it, that things are looking upright for the Niners at the right time. And I mean, I've been waiting for this George Kittle moment for quite a long time. It feels like forever at this point between injuries and them, you know, needing his extra support with his hand in the dirt. I mean, to get him in the end zone, I became the happiest person alive so Niners continue to roll we're going to start this conversation we'll probably have to pick it back up on the other side but as for somebody who's continuing to roll and staying hot you have got the commanders 42 to 14 over the Cardinals and Daniels just continuing to absolutely flex 233 passing yards one touchdown one interception but it's okay guys he's brand new to the league give him a minute Robinson on the ground 101 rushing yards and this team commanded from halfway or middle towards the first quarter all of the second quarter top of the third quarter and closed out strong what did we see in this one uh daniels is now the odds on favorite to win offensive rookie of the year he's sitting at minus 120. uh they continue to put him in good spots uh cliff kingsbury is calling just an amazing game every single week as the offensive coordinator uh Daniels 26 of 30 as I said the other day he continues to be remarkably efficient they are putting him in great spots the ground game is working there are a variety of options around him that can catch the ball move the chains mix it up he runs then we have Brian Robinson they won without Austin Eckler like everything is looking great for the commanders Jaden Daniels is awesome over on completions every week might be the best bet it's not yards the completions might be the best bet for Daniels outside of the rushing crop so Great stuff from the Commanders. Marvin Harrison got a touchdown on the other side. We'll touch on that after the break. Uh, but, man, Washington, they are moving right now. Yes, and I'm glad that you mentioned the play calling because the buy-in is so strong from these players to the head coach, to I mean, across the board. And buy-in is going to get you further than anybody anticipates. So we'll see how the Commanders continue to roll. As Tom mentioned, we'll continue to break this game down. we got a quick break coming up here, so continue to hang with us. Pro Football Today on Sports Grid TV. Catch you guys on the other side of this break. Anyone that's been to a sporting event, the atmosphere before a game, I think Game Time Decisions has that same exact atmosphere. This is our arena. This is what we do. There is going to be an energy to Game Time Decisions that you will feel night in and night out. The excitement you get when you when you lock your bets and when you're figuring out what you want to do, we can zone in on the biggest games each night. I want this to be the place that people come to before the game start, so they feel as ready as possible to lock in their cards. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. We're gonna go through every single thing, and I've got a great team behind me that's gonna help me get the job done. There is not gonna be a better place, I promise you, than Game Time Decisions to get that new information, react to it, and be able to then bet accordingly. We will have everything at our disposal, and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on SportsGrid. Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on SportsGrid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports screen.
back at it with Pro Football today. It's the post game show with Casey Hudson and Tom Vecchio here on Sports Grid TV. And before we went to that break, oh boy, were we praising the Commanders three and one and just continuing to roll. This team is being led very well from the top. And then, of course, you got a rookie quarterback that's staying hot. But let's talk about the other side of the ball for one second, or the other team, I should say. While it wasn't the flashiest performance by Murray, you mentioned this guy, the guy to keep an eye on on the Cardinals roster at all times. And it's James Conner who comes back to life on the ground, 104 rushing yards through 18 carries, helping this team try to stay in it. But I say try just to kind of, you know, show some respect to the players that we love on the Cardinals roster. But what did you see with the Cardinals? Of course, you continue to point out the best players to ride out through the season with. And uh, Conner just coming in hot. Yeah, tough game from the Cardinals. They obviously started off super hot with that touchdown and it kind of fell apart from there. I, you know, I did mention Connor on the halftime show I, I did at 2.30. I was on his combined rushing plus receiving, which uh, was sitting at 61 and a half, I believe. is just way too low. Like, this is the player that they need to have the ball a minimum 18 times combined. He was 18 on the ground, one in the air. But, like, that's the role he should be playing, and that's a player we can trust on a week-to-week -week basis. I also think we can trust Marvin Harrison. I have a tough time trusting Kyler Murray, and I know that sounds weird saying I trust the receiver but not the quarterback. Mm -hmm. I think we can look to Marvin Harrison potentially on not just yards, but I think longest reception because him getting the ball down the field is only taking one pass, and that could be a 25-yard completion, 30-yard completion. We've seen him with these long touchdowns. And even though Murray may have a lackluster game overall, he just needs the one pass to get to Harrison. So I'm kind of lukewarm on Kyler Murray right now, but very in on James Conner and Marvin Harrison. Yeah, it makes complete sense to me because you could not trust the quarterback, but you could trust the wide receiver to do everything possible to reel in and find control of that ball or put their body on the line to make the play happen. So you see a number of wide receivers that are willing to do it. As for receivers that can reel in the ball, they can pick up those yardages, they can be very trustworthy. We've got the Bengals that get back in the W column, 34-24 to 24 over the Panthers. And uh, Burrow, 232 passing yards, two tutties, unfortunate interception. But you got Brown on the ground, 80 rushing yards, 15 carries, two tutties running for him. But it was Jamar Chase that showed why he is needed on this roster. 85 receiving yards through three receptions. Do the math, people. One touchdown. And one of those massive receptions, I think, was, what, 63 yards? I I, I don't know. Uh, you got to walk us through this one. But Joe Burrow with uh, very little words at the end of the game, more importantly, just focusing ahead. What did you see in this one? Uh, the second week in a row that the Bengals have put up over 30 points this time. They come away with the win. We did the Monday night show uh, last week against the Commanders. And, you know, we said, like, this is the time for the Bengals' offense to get firing on all cylinders. They got T. Higgins back last week. He looked much better this week. Like, this is what they need to have. Like, this is what their offense should be operating at when they have one of the best quarterbacks in the league. They have two of the best receivers in the league. Gave a nice rushing attack with Brown and Moss. This is what we should be seeing from them. Their defense needs to tighten up. You're giving up 30-plus points to the Commanders last week, who are great. Now you're giving up 24 points to the Panthers. That's looking pretty rough. When I, They play the Ravens next week, I believe, right? And, and that's so. a I, – I think so. Like, that is – yeah, it's a two-and-a-half point spread in favor of the Road Ravens. So, I mean, what the Ravens uh, did over the past few weeks, now they're going up against this porous Bengals defense. We could be looking at a lot of points, despite it being like a traditional, like, AFC North game, which we should be – seeing as like a lower scoring game, the Ravens could get things going early, which would put the Bengals in a big passing game script, which probably means Burrow, Chase, and Higgins props again. Oh, something to definitely lock in and keep an eye on now. And I'm glad you kind of mentioned a quick look ahead there because while they do have the Ravens coming up next week, after that they have the Giants. And when we're talking about the Bengals locking down on their defense, they're going against kidding neighbors and company that are trying to continue to strive for bigger games. The Giants have been sneaky in certain categories when it comes to their play. So they don't want to underestimate that and they don't want another have another team come in and completely take over. Uh, we'll close out recapping with the Browns versus the Raiders. Raiders take this one 20 to 16. This is probably another one of those games where you look at it and you go, what did we just watch? But uh, what you see in this one as they try to figure out what they're going to do with Garner Minshew, who came up with 130 passing yards today, but oh, it was no flash here on the other side. Sean Watson, 176, one touchdown, one interception. I mean, again, what did we watch? Oh, we watched a whole lot of nothing in this game where the Browns scored on their opening drive. They were moving the ball. They looked great. We have the, and I spoke 
relatively highly about Amari Cooper uh, on the 12 p.m. show that I do and the 2.30 show. When I said Max Crosby was not playing for the Raiders, and I know Deshaun Watson's been off to a slow start this year, but I said, listen, Max Crosby, pass rusher, gets off after the quarterback. If there's one time for the Browns to flex their passing offense, it would be the time where they're going up against a Raiders defense that got carved apart by Andy Dolan last week, and they're missing their best defensive player. So if there's just an extra second or so that – Deshaun Watson wouldn't be under pressure because Max Crosby wasn't playing. This was the game, and that didn't happen. I am going to be basically completely out on the Browns. Yes, they are going to be expected to activate Nick Chubb into his practice window to see if they can get him back, but the Raiders snuck away with the win with nothing impressive. They didn't have Devontae Adams. Yeah, Jacoby Myers had a good game. They had some amount of success with Zamir White, but this was a bad game to have any amount of highlights from. Oh, yes. And I was right there with you with the idea of Crosby not being in the mix. He's the guy that applies the most pressure, but Raiders defense still able to come through with three sacks on Watson throughout the game. And then continuing on their side of the ball while they're trying to figure out if they should bring in O'Connell or what they should do at the quarterback uh, spot at all. Zero touchdowns pass in, obviously no interceptions, but still no progression there. Their wide receiver, their top wide receiver of the day, being Myers with 49 receiving yards through five receptions. That is four poor, poor passing and airing out the ball. It wasn't that much better on the ground. Madison with 60 rushing yards through five carries and then followed up by that with White with 50 rushing yards. But this was through 17 carries. You think about how you're trying to spread that out. He's not making any progressions on the ground if he needs 17 carries to get 50 yards. So the Raiders have a lot to figure out. I'm sure we'll hear a lot more tantrums coming out of Antonio Pierce and company. But we don't have too much more to get to here on Pro Football Today, the postgame show on SportsGrid TV. What we will do is start looking ahead to the doubleheader tomorrow night because we have the Pro Football pregame show. Casey Hudson, Tom Vecchio, Dave Sheriffin, Adam Kaufman, and it's always a good time. We give you guys a lot of bets, a lot of angles, and a lot of entertainment. So mark your calendars to join us tomorrow for the doubleheader Monday Night Football. We're going to start previewing that one. Stick with us on the other side of this break. Anyone that's been to a sporting event, the atmosphere before a game, I think Game Time Decisions has that same exact atmosphere. This is our arena. This is what we do. There is going to be an energy to Game Time Decisions that you will feel night in and night out. The excitement you get when you when you lock your bets and when you're figuring out what you want to do, we can zone in on the biggest games each night. I want this to be the place that people come to before the game start so they feel as ready as possible to lock in their cards. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. We're gonna go through every single thing and I've got a great team behind me that's gonna help me get the job done. There is not gonna be a better place, I promise you, than Game Time Decisions to get that new information, react to it, and be able to then bet accordingly. We will have everything at our disposal and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on SportsGrid. Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on SportsGrid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports screen.
one more rally here at Pro Football Today, the post-game show with Casey Hudson and Tom Vecchio. We ran through the Sunday slate, the top games, the most entertaining ones, the least entertaining ones, the narrow scores, the big margins. Either way, we still have plenty of football because this NFL season is just getting going. And in case you missed it, Pro Football Today pre-game show tomorrow we got a double header again for monday night football which means casey hudson tom vecchio dave sherapan and adam kaufman will be bringing you odds lines first half player prop bets same game parlays love it leave it all the things you don't want to miss it come party with us for pre-game here on sports grid tv tomorrow i believe that starts at 6 p.m eastern time Correct. but as for now we're going to start to look ahead we're going to prepare you for the party tomorrow and i tortured tom with the best question possible saying which game do we want to start with for tomorrow night and uh, i think it was an easy toss-up right miami Dolphins yeah there's the Titans. No, yeah <laughs> there's there's one game tomorrow night uh that isn't good and there is one game tomorrow that is very good and we're going to start with or we're going to end the show with the very good game and that's gonna be the lions versus the seahawks and I want to say, I, I've seen a lot of people talk about the Seahawks and their defense is great and they're, you know, the top of the league in terms of fewest yards allowed. I want to say, let's pump the brakes on that. Week one, they played the Broncos with a rookie quarterback, Bo Nix, starting. Didn't see much from there. Week two, they play the Patriots with Jacoby Reset, not a heavy passing offense. Week three, they played the Dolphins in the first game that Tua Tonga Vailoa does not play. And we saw Skylar Thompson and Tim Boyle play. We have yet to see the Seahawks defense truly be tested through the air. So, yes, their stats look great at face value. They're not giving up a whole lot of yards. They haven't been tested. Jared Goff at home in the Dome. This is a Jameson Williams week for the Lions. I'm looking at Jameson Williams touchdown, Jameson Williams over over on yards. And most importantly, Jameson Williams over on his longest reception. I will break all of this down tomorrow night on the pregame show that Casey mentioned. We will touch on the Dolphins game against the Titans. I have a very, very <laughs> specific angle I'm looking at for that game in their backfield. Not expecting a whole lot of scoring in that game. Much more from the Detroit side of things. See, this is why you join us, football fans, because sometimes you got to get creative with the angles and keep some uninteresting teams, non-interesting teams, whatever the best way is to say that, interesting, which is what we will do on Pro Football today, the pregame show. But excited to hear those angles when it comes to the Dolphins Sticking with the Seahawks for just a second, because over the last week, you have mentioned a guy to keep an eye on. Maybe it might not be rushing yards per se, but it could be finding him in the end zone. So if the Seahawks are going to compete with the Lions, their first real true competition, which I completely agree with you on, um, who's some key players that you are keeping your eyes on in any aspect, receiving, rushing, or getting those tutties that we'll talk about further tomorrow? For the Seahawks, it's going to be Jackson Smith and Jigba, the second-year wide receiver. When we're looking at his underlying metrics, he has been phenomenal. He is second on the team in targets. He's tied for the team in receptions. Uh, good, uh, Not so much red zone usage this year, but good underlying metrics. He's involved in the offense. He's right there 1A, 1B with DK Metcalf. He just hasn't scored yet, and I will continuously buy into specifically receivers that have high involvement in the offense, High, tar- uh, high target share, high yards per route run, all these underlying metrics, good A dot, et cetera, et cetera. But he just hasn't scored yet. It's like bound to happen for them. This is not a uh, Deontay Johnson situation from a couple of years ago where he has top 10 in the league in receptions and zero touchdowns. That's not going to happen for JSN. So I'm buying into JSN on the Seahawks side of things. I am buying into Jameson Williams on the Detroit side of things. And again, the backfield from Miami, that is going to be the key piece for that game. Absolutely. And maybe I'm looking at this from a different standpoint because DK Metcalf wears one of the sickest visors in the league. So, of course, I'm going to throw him in the mix. And you don't want it to be too obvious when it comes to going against the Lions. But something to point out, three meets versus the Lions. He sits at a 6.3 average of receptions. He sits at an 8.3 average of being targeted and his lowest receiving yards versus the Lions has been 63 receiving yards. Now, the Lions did make some appropriate offseason moves so that they can be a more formidable defense. I will keep that in mind. But 63 receiving yards, 149 receiving yards, and 75 receiving yards has been the production for DK Metcalf. So maybe the visor just continues to illuminate his success versus this team. I don't know. It's just what I'm hoping for. But as for now, that's a wrap for Tom Vecchio and myself, Casey Hudson. Thank you so much for joining us for the Pro Football Today 
post game show. But as I've reminded you time and time again, join us tomorrow for the Pro Football Today pregame show right back here on Sports Grid TV, 6 p.m. Eastern time. The party starts. Casey, Tom, Dave, and Adam breaking down lines, odds, angles, and bets. As for tonight, I hope everybody had a fantastic Sunday, and we will see you guys back here tomorrow on Sports Grid TV.